Thank you, thank you so much. It's an absolute honor to be here and I'm so excited to see so many of you in the audience with such dedication and passion around biliary disease. So I've been, talk, I've been tasked today to really talk about the role of imaging during cholecystectomy and in particular gonna focus on ICG. So I just wanna start out in the room and ask everybody here, who performs some type of imaging during a gallbladder all of the time? Okay, how about selectively? How about never? Oh, oh, I see one, <laughs> one in the back. So you can see it's a rather controversial topic and there's really not been one statement where we can kind of hang our hat on. So these are my disclosures. I don't believe any of them impact my talk today. And again, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a brief overview of intraoperative cholangiogram, intraoperative ultrasound, because Dr. Zeal would be very sad if I didn't do that, and fluorescent cholangiography. And just another show of hands, when you do your imaging, who does IOC? Ultrasound? Oh, I see you there, thank you. Um, and how about ICG, anybody starting to use this? Great, I'd love to hear your thoughts maybe after the conference if you can find me in the back. So when we think of intraoperative imaging, I think many of us think of the standard intraoperative cholangiogram where we're essentially putting dye within the biliary tree and system to try to look at the anatomy. And really there are five reasons to do a cholangiography during a case. First, it's really an essential and unique skill component of the cholecystectomy. If you're gonna do cholecystectomies, even if you don't do some type of imaging each and every time, you should be able to in case you get into trouble, if there's a barren anatomy or if you have a question. Second, it really enables accurate interpretation of your biliary findings assuming that you're able to interpret the cholangiogram correctly, which we'll talk about shortly. But it can really give you an idea of sort of where you are in space, and it can really help identify a barren biliary anatomy. It's also the prerequisite to performing a lab common bile duct exploration, if that's a skill in your toolbox. Does anybody do lab common bile duct? Good, I like to see that. I think it's coming back in popularity. And finally, and I think most importantly, it might reduce the incidence as well as the severity of a biliary injury, and it also might help you recognize and pick one up early. And I think this is reflected in the Safe Sages <coughs> Cholecystectomy Program, where step four really encourages everybody to make liberal use of cholangiography, and especially in difficult cases or in cases where your anatomy is questionable. But really, what are the facts about cholangiography, right? Because if this was perfect and if this was easy, we probably would have all adopted it. Well, little do we all know, but about 70% of patients with abnormalities, the actual uh, cholangiography is misinterpreted. And while it might prevent higher injuries when it's interpreted correctly, if we're not doing a good job at interpreting the fills we have, it kind of negates some of the benefits. It does increase the chance of injury detection before and a timely repair but it's really not always able to identify aberrant ducts. Well, what about intraoperative ultrasound? So intraoperative ultrasound, you can see the picture, I believe on screen right, is a picture of the ultrasound probe looking over the area. And on the left, you can see what that image looks like. Obviously, some of the pros is it's not costly, there's no radiation involved in it, and it actually has a very good sensitivity and specificity. And if you look at head-to-head -head comparisons of intraoperative ultrasound to intraoperative cholangiogram, you'll actually comparable, if not better, detection rates. And it's also easy to use once you have a handle on it. But again, that's part of the cons as well. It's very user dependent. The ultrasound probe is only as good as the hands it's in and the person who's trained to use it. There is a learning curve, and if you do need to do an intervention, you're not there and set to do it if you need to retrieve a common bile duct stone. And there's also the capital investment of buying the ultrasound machine if your um, institution doesn't already have one for other functions. So that brings me to ICG, and I think this is the new kid on the block. It's been a very hot topic. There's a lot of uh, buzz about this. And what is ICG? So this is essentially a lyophilized, which is a very fancy way of saying dehydrated green powder. It has 25 milligrams of indocyanine green with sodium iodide, and it's dissolved in sterile uh, water for IV use. And how it works is that it binds to plasma proteins, namely albumin, and it's circulated and taken up by the hepatic parenchymal cells. It's then secreted entirely into the bile, and it's dose and time dependent. So you can imagine something that's preferably secreted through the bile might pose something interesting to look at when we're trying to identify anatomy. 
And what it does is it absorbs light in the near infrared region and emits light at a longer wavelength, which really gives us an opportunity to capitalize on that with some of the different technology that we have. And here you can see what this looks like intraoperatively. A component of these systems is that you can see the green light here, which is the cholangiography, as well as a vascular view and a traditional white light view. And as I hit play, what you'll essentially see is the images captured um, after administration. And here you can see the cystic duct and the common bile duct and the confluence of the two, and it's actually quite identifiable. Here's another image, an intraoperative shot, thanks to uh, Dr. Yu, who supplied this, again showing something similar. So really, what are the data that are available about this technology? On the last literature search I did, there's about 37 articles assessing this technology during cholecystectomy. Human case studies, though, are really limited to safety evaluations and smaller case series. And while no major adverse events were identified, we can't really make a statement on its efficacy, more on the safety and feasibility profile. However, one thing that was concluded is that this is easy to adapt and use. And probably some of the most compelling data actually came out of Ohio State and was recently published in Surgical Endoscopy in 2015, where they looked at intraoperative cholangiogram versus this near-infrared cholangiography after dissection to assess the ductal visualization. And essentially what they saw is that the near-infrared uh, cholangiography, they were able to visualize the cystic duct 95% of the time, the common bile duct 76% of the time, which was comparable to IOC, and the common hepatic duct about 70% of the time. And from this, they concluded that this is a safe and effective alternative to intraoperative cholangiogram for imaging the extrahepatic biliary structures during laparoscopic cholecystectomy. This was also corroborated by a follow-up study of 53 patients, which demonstrated similar findings. So before we go on, I'll say it's perfect, we do have some limitations. We don't understand the way this technology performs under different circumstances. We don't understand its utility and effectivity when there's an occluded cystic duct. It cannot evaluate for cholodocolithiasis. Its efficacy in real-world settings, such as obesity and acute cholecystitis, remains unknown. And there is a rather large capital investment involved with this, as well as the cost of variable disposable, including the ICG, which can range $75 to $150, depending on the contract with your company. So the key takeaways today is our goal is to minimize bile duct surgery. If people were at the earlier biliary session, you'll know we are not really making a dent in moving the needle to safety. And our rates of complications, our rates of injury are really uh, plateaued over the last 10 years. Intraoperative imaging is valuable, and surgeons should develop this as part of the skill set for an intraoperative cholangiogram. And this should honestly be used limit, uh, liberally to help assess for biliary anatomy, particularly in difficult cases or where anatomy is unclear. I do think ICG is a promising technology, and more data are needed, and we're hoping to answer some of that questions in a prospective study that we'll hopefully be conducting through the SAGES Safe Cholecystectomy uh, Task Force within the next few months. So with that, I appreciate your time, I appreciate your candor and honesty, and thank you. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Dana. Uh, we have time for a question. Dana, would you um, mind? Yes, I have a question from the, uh, from the front microphone here, please. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Very excellent presentation, Dana. Lars Henriksson, Stockholm, Sweden. I have a question. Uh, when it's mostly important to visualize the bile ducts during acute uh, cholecystitis, where the conditions are most difficult, yeah. uh, do you see, a ro and, and Turnquist and co-workers have shown that uh, intraoperative cholangiography is especially effective in acute cholecystitis. What do you think is the role for ICG here? And, and yeah, that's the perfect question, and that's what we're trying to figure out with the study that we're setting up. So we're going to be setting up a prospective evaluation, multi-center, with 10 centers selected, to understand that and to figure out what is its utility in real-world settings. How does it perform in acute cholecystitis? How does it perform in obesity, in different conditions, which make it a less ideal setting. So I don't think we have that answer today, but hopefully within you know a short period of time, we'll, we'll have it. Thank you. We have one, time for one more question. Oh. Yes. Can I ask for the last talk? Thank uh, you. Wissam Swadi from Iraq. Uh, 
if I'm allowed to ask, is there any history of allergies to the ICG? So it's, it actually, it's, ICG has been used for the last 50 years. It's been FDA approved for a very long time. I, there's been no reports of adverse events with it. You cannot use it in somebody who has an iodine allergy or sensitivity, somebody who's pregnant, but outside of those parameters, it's actually extraordinarily safe with an excellent safety profile and track record for safety.